worry over the security situation across the country. They say the situation is affecting the growth of the transport sector and the country at large. The national president of the association, Yusuf Lawa Luthman, revealed that kidnappers have now formed the habit of hijacking trucks on Nigeria's highways. The activities of bandits, kidnappers and thieves have also made life miserable for drivers as they no longer have safe passage on the road. The association also mentioned that the bad state of these roads makes it easier for the criminals to attack them. According to him, he says, and I quote, we've had many cases where drivers were kidnapped while on duty and some had their trucks hijacked at gunpoint along some of the major roads in the country. And this not only affects our business, they say, but the economy at large. That's what we'll be talking about now. With us in the studio is a public affairs analyst, Michael Adeleye. Thank you very much for joining us again on TVC Breakfast. Good morning. What are your thoughts? Uh, earlier on, we were speaking about um, insecurity in the land and um, you know, narrowing it down to the state of our roads. What link are you also seeing into this whole uh, matter at hand? Thank you very much for having me this morning. Um, I think the state of our roads at the moment in the last 10 to 15 years is becoming more deplorable. And um, this, there needs to be huge investments from both the subnational and the national government. And that's number one. Number two, um, when you talk about the maintenance of our roads as well, we're having lapses in there because there's one thing to invest usually on our roads. And there's another thing to be able to put measures in place to actually maintain those roads for a particular um, term or the extension of the roads. But what we're having at this point in time is putting the money in there, and at the end of the whole thing, it's been left by its own to, to, to its fight. So basically, the weather comes in and mess up the roads, the users also, and also the, 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 the condition of the, the road users as well. So if we don't take care and look into all those um, issues um, for now, we're going to have a situation whereby all our roads in the country will become unmoterable. And this is going to be one of the reasons why we have all these kidnappers, banditry, and all this criminality perpetrating on this road, because vehicles can't really move um, according to how they should be able to move. Then also we talk about the lightning of the roads as well, street lights. Right. Um, majority of our roads in this country, there are no street lights. They, you have, they, I mean, after six, seven o'clock in, in the evening, it becomes very um, impossible sometimes because of no lights. And also, you have vehicles that have no proper roadworthiness. Uh, they have no brake lights, they have no rear light, they have no um, functionality vehicles on our roads. So, all this. Um, catalyst contributes to the menace that we're having at the moment. Uh, so, 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 many, so many issues you've actually ruled out. Ruled out. But um, if you look at so, some contributing factors to the bad roads that we have, you know, sometimes when people go out on pro, in, uh, you know, to protest against whatever policy the government is introducing into the country, um, some you know, set up you know, bonfires on the road and all of these, yeah. they said they contribute to the, the bad roads that we experience. So, Talk to us about how citizens need to be also responsible in keeping the government's infrastructure. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's our, I mean, the government provides these funds to, I mean, to build these roads, but it's our own responsibility as citizens to ensure that we maintain and keep those roads for our own usage because it's our own property. But what you see is this is, you see people driving on the roads, they eat all their remnants from the car, they just throw it on the roads. I mean, there are laws and, uh, I mean, in place that should actually apprehend whoever messes up our roads, but nobody's doing anything about it. So people throw foods on the road, all sort of forms of materials on the roads, and you see, when they, like we just mentioned now, when, when there are protests, people burn tires on their roads, and that messes up the roads. When tankers carrying or conveying um, petrol, diesel, force on the road, that also doesn't match with bitumen. When those spill on the road, it actually makes that road become more weak. And if no measure has been taken when that happens, then you, you find that deplorable, I mean, you know, those roads. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, observers have um, called for 
you can use any, any phrase now, but you know, the, the one that sticks out is the government should issue a state of emergency on the issue of insecurity, uh, tackle it head on, multi-sectoral, multi-dimensional and all of that. Regarding the state of the roads, uh, people have also asked questions as to where are the good old highway patrol yeah. forces that we, we used to have that we don't seem to have anymore other than the regular police roadblocks that you see. And, you know, there are few, you know, according to even if you travel, how many of them do you see? And um, how well are they poised to addressing the, um, the spate of kidnappings that are usually experienced on the highways mm -hmm. and all of that? There's also the issue of FEMA. Uh, road uh, management agency, the Federal Road Man Management Agency, if they can get to work with these drivers and security forces again to, you know, address the bad state of the road. What, what do you have to say about this, these problems? Well, in, in my opinion, I think there's, there's an issue when we, when we talk about federal roads and state roads. Okay. That's one of the I mean, basic problems that we're having at the moment. I mean, you have some roads in the country whereby they say you can't touch those roads because it's a federal road. So when that road, when that road goes wrong and the federal government are now attending to repair those roads, the state government can't touch it. Now, that state of the road becomes deplorable. And once that happens, who takes care of the roads? Now, the state roads as well, you have local government roads as well. Now, even the street, the local, the local roads that we have in our, the areas that we have in our communities, some of those, so when they become so bad, if you want to volunteer as a, as a business or as an individual to repair those roads, they will deter you from, from, I mean, being able to take charge and repair those roads. So the law needs to be looked into and amend those laws. I mean, if federal government roads should be able to be take, taken over by a state government to repair them, and if there's a, a, a way of compensating that state government, they should be, that should be in place. The local roads as well, the same thing. I mean, you can't put that responsibility of repairing of roads in the hands of the government alone. You have civil societies, you have businesses, you have NGOs who wants to put their money in there and to actually make sure that those roads are possible. But the laws have been too strict for people to be able to say, right, I need to fix this road. So the law needs to be looked into in the first place so that anyone that thinks they can actually repair those roads could actually put in their money in there and repair those roads. So when we look into the law and fix those laws, then obviously it works in that perspective. And sometimes you see uh, government agencies you know, fixing the roads or you see whoever is... His, 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 um Whoever has gotten the contract to fix yeah. the road is you know, doing the road. Is there a way citizens can also make sure that the quality of, um, the quality of infrastructure, the quality of the maintenance of the road or the building of the road is, is done well uh, as against what we'll see government of the day fixing the, uh, fixing the roads even before the government packs from office? You, you start to see the roads you know, getting bad. Uh, so how do you think you know, we need to also ensure quality content you know, being given to the uh, to the citizens in terms of road delivery? Well, well, well that has to come from the government and because I don't have an experience. No, no, because government may not be able to monitor governments because it's yeah. just the same you know, people within the government. I'm saying those who are professionals, you know, trying to see what they've done or what they are doing mm -hmm. so as to call the attention of the people to this thing they are giving us is not going to last long. Yeah, well, well it, that would be dependent, I mean, depending on how, if you have the experience, if, if I, I mean, if you're not a structural engineer, yeah. how do you have an experience of what quality of the, um, of the roads that's going to be given by the government? So if we want to fix this and make sure that it works properly, what we need to do is once um, a project has been given out to the public by the government, there, there should be a stakeholder in place. The community that is involved, the, the, the state that is involved, and the structural engineers, and everybody comes together to actually access the quality and the materials that they're going to have to use to fix those two. But if that's not going to be, I mean, be put in place, how do, we, how, do we, how do we monitor this? It's going to be very difficult. Another issue, <clears throat> again, is how these kidnappers even see... Of course, you've, you've spoken about uh, the absence of streetlights yeah. and, mm -hmm. and, and all those other factors that could be fueling, uh, making our highways that are usually busy, even at night, making yeah. our highways um, you know, a haven for, for kidnappers. But... Uh, I just wonder, you know, what else you're looking at in terms of, um, you know, the larger picture 
as to what is feeling uh, the insecurity that we see, uh, the dimension, the disturbing proportions that we see now? I, 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 I read something over the week, and um, people were actually pointing fingers of blame to the military. The architecture is not being done properly, the military are not functioning properly. If you look at the, I mean, for my own research, the military has only about 10 to 20 percent in this whole issue. We need to go to the root cause of why we're having this banditry, this kidnapping. Look, the population of this country has been constituted by, by 70 to 80 percent of youth. Now, the question is, what do we have this youth doing? We have unemployment. We have, we, I mean, most of our graduates don't have, they lack the skills that employers need. Now, the, the, there's a saying that, that goes, um, an idle hand is a devil's workshop. Now, banditry, kidnapping, and all this criminality that, that has been perpetrated by going around the country, the military has a little bit of um, intake in this. No matter how you invest in the, into the military and the architecture, it's not going to solve the problem. We need to provide jobs for our youth, training, skill acquisition. If we don't have all those in place, it's a social problem we're having in here. Social um, economic problem. All these banditry trade that, that, that we see all around have been perpetrated by the youth. Okay? And, and, and if we don't fix them with good jobs, we get them to get something to do, skill acquisition, we're still going to keep on saying this. Look, there's poverty in the land. Everybody has to feed. They need to pay their rent, they need to feed, they need to spend money on this and that. But where, the, where, where are they going to get this money from? They have to do something. So when we fix the social economic problem first, then the military will be able to actually tackle the rest of the problem. So the criminality that we're seeing today is the social economic problem that we're having that's been, um, I would say, 70% of them from the youth. And if we don't fix this one, then obviously all this criminality is going to be, we're going to see them all the time. Well, the, 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 the road users, especially those who move, um, you know, right from, from one place to the other, talking about, um, I think, um, is it NATO? Yeah, the yeah. national president, you know, we, who raised this alarm, saying that it's affecting, you know, the movement of goods and services from one place to the other, even the oil and diesel, which they have been transported to different places. So uh, talk to us about the implication of these on price of goods and services, you know, uh, especially transport fare for ordinary commuters. Yeah, it's, a, it's a spillover. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, if you have to travel, um, you have punctured tires, you have your shock absorber being messed up, mm -hmm. and all this adds up to cost. So obviously, if I'm moving my goods from point A to B, and it's going to cost me so much. Now, we're talking about the price of fuel, petrol and diesel. We're talking about the price of fixing my car when the roads are bad. We're talking about extra cost of security. We well, have to move valuable goods from one point to the other. I need to hire police and to hire security to actually guard my goods from that point to another. Now, all these costs will spill over to the, price, to the price of the goods and services. So at the moment, we're having inflation, hyperinflation. Everything, if you look at the round, I mean, the country is going through a hardship now. Now, the reason for that is we have social economic problem. We have criminality, banditry, and all that. All this thing equates to cost, and this, all this cost has to spill over to all these goods and services. So we're going to have high prices of goods and services all the time. Is the police well positioned? Uh, is, is our current security architecture you know, well positioned to also combat this? As in, wh even when we have the good roads, uh, we also need some form of security on, on, on the entire stretches of, of the expressways. But our, is, is our current security architecture poised enough to deal with this too? Well, we can if we actually monitor and train our security architecture, I mean security personnel properly, especially the police. The corruption of the police on our roads is unbearable and it's just embarrassing. Every, especially when you travel from points A to B, all those roadblocks that you see on the roads, when they stop you, obviously the first thing I'm gonna ask you is, what do you have for us? Now, if I'm being stopped, for example, I do ask my question, I do ask the question, I say, why, why are you stopping me? What's tell me the reason why I'm being stopped? So they have an explanation. The next thing they're gonna say is, okay, can I see your driver's license, your vehicle particulars, and if you give it to them, some of them are illiterate. 
I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this unapologetically. They can't even read what you have on those documents. They look at it, some of those people are expired documents. They look at it as if they're checking anything, they give it back to you, then the next thing is, okay, what do you have for us? So if I understand the fact that if I'm perpetuating any criminality somewhere and in my car, and if I come across a police officer and do that, I can bribe my way out, it's easier for me to commit any crime I want to commit. Because I'm not saying, I'm not putting a blanket on all the police um, I'm forcing, but majority of them are found with collecting bribes, tapes on here, and they will demand it from you, plain out here. Unfortunately, it's not only the police that are on the road. We, we've got the VIO, we've got the even Nigerian soldiers on the road, we've got um, FRC, etc. Are you saying the police stand out? Okay, okay. Let me, let me come to the, other, to, to the other guys. We have the... Um, um, what's the other one? The, the highway patrol, what, what, what are they called? FRC, the road safety guys. Road safety guys and the VIO. Now, there's a problem with these guys. I have this question that I've asked them severally. Why is it that the FRC guys only stop vehicles if you don't use a seatbelt? Is that the reason why you're being put on the roads? You have vehicles who have bad tires. You have vehicles who don't have rear lights and back lights. You have vehicles who are on road, I mean, road unworthiness. Yeah. They don't stop them. So my question is, why are you on the roads? You have all these vehicles that put overloading stuff on their car, and when they get in there, they bribe those guys, and they go on their way. You have some vehicles who just move, I mean, zigzag on the road, they can't be stable on the road, and you see all these vehicles, you can't stop them. But the only vehicle they stop are the ones, actually, if you don't put them in the seatbelts. That is questionable. That's what the FRSA. Now, Coming back to Lagos State, for example, the last man. Now, I'm not sure if anyone out there, and I could throw the question to you guys as well. I've never seen the Lagos Traffic Management Authority stopping, dealing with all those um, public transporters. They don't obey traffic lights. When well, everybody stops at the traffic light, they find their way and they go through. So one day I stopped and I asked one last man, I said, right. Are these guys above the law that you don't stop and they don't obey the traffic right? The guy says, sorry, sir, if we stop them, they have someone, a big guy somewhere, they're going to call, and they're going to ask, ask us to leave them alone. So they have no control about it. So when you look at all those criminals that have been on our roads, I mean, the functionality of those things are actually from those guys as well. They, don't, they have their own regime, their own government, actually from the NURTW. They don't respect the rules and regulations of our roads. They drive indiscriminately. They stop on the roads. They just drop and pick up passengers anywhere. They drive with impunity. They damage other cars. And you can't do nothing about it. But the worry, the, 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 the worrying part of it is they are above the laws of the state when it comes to traffic and um, road regulations. So we need to look into that. Right. And um, okay, so the, the question I asked earlier on about the police, narrowing it down to the police, because when you compare the police operations on the highways <clears throat> with that of the FRSC, the FRSC is in armed, and you know, before you get to see an army checkpoint, so to speak, on the expressway, you would have seen at least one police checkpoint. But, you know, in advocacies as this now that you have made so far, uh, uh, FRSC, for example, now those safety guys, would you also be advocating to make the highway safer, that uh, they be armed? Because they, they aren't, they are not armed. Uh, they don't have, you know, the rifles and, and the likes now to also maintain the peace on the highway in addition to their other mandates. Unfortunately, we can't allow every agency, I mean, patrol, to, patrol uh, right. to be armed. I mean, that's not safe for us. I mean, what I would suggest is um, a police officer or a security, an armed officer, maybe the NSC, they say, or a police officer should be stationed with those guys when they are performing their duties. I mean, unfortunately, we don't have enough police officers in, uh, I mean, in the country, but obviously for the safety of the majority of road users in this country, when all those guys are performing their duties, Especially the F FRS guys, the LASMA guys, the Trace and everybody. There should be security officers that, that were that are armed to actually stay stationed in there should in case they need help or they want to call for help. Mm. So that speaks to the collaboration, interagency collaboration. collaboration. You see, you know, the police collaboration. It should be a synergy, a, a synergy between 
the um, roads, uh, what's it called? The all, all these agencies, agencies who, who, who with, man, the, with security forces. But are you not worried when you see that the or guys at the top, so to speak, they understand what interagency collaboration means, but when the, those who are supposed to be the foot soldiers do not understand, and then you see them in videos trending, you know, brawling over, you know, unreasonable issues. Yeah. So if those who are educated, the elitist among them, understand the essence of interagency collaboration, but those who are on the, on, on the field do not understand this. What does this speak, uh, what does this say about um, understanding the role that they are, they are supposed to play? <clears throat> like, like, like rightly mentioned, we need to be, um, begin to get rid of your guard at the top. If I'm being given a position to work as the head of um, LASMA or FRSC, I should be given the autonomy to do my work effectively without any interference. But what we see here is most of these guys need help because they've been, their hands are tight, so to say. They can't really perform their duties and function effectively according to the rules and regulations of what that position is because they have somebody at the top, they're political um, I'm, I'm, I'm big guys in there who influence their performance. So that's, and, and that goes across all these agencies. In the well, I, I bet to differ. I bet to differ in the sense that some people who take this job, when they get on the road, the first thing that comes to their mind, in fact, the, the motivating factor that, 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 that gets them into the, perfect, in, into the job in the first place is for them to make money because they feel as a policeman or as an FRC guy, you can stop vehicle, you know, cut corners, make some money. I'm, just, I'm not saying everyone, but do you not see that as a possible uh, I, factor? I say that. Because they have been trained before, before being deployed. That is, that, is, that is corruption and corruption and corruption again. I find it so I'm not quite too sure how true is this. I mean, when um, policemen have been deployed on our roads or those agents on our roads, they report, I highlight they report back to their bosses. They need to make money. I mean, some side money for their bosses. It's a cartel. It's, it's, it's a cartel. <laughs> So they operate with impunity. Let me give you the story. I mean, I don't know if I have the time. Look, I went to the police station. I won't mention the name in this Lagos, and um, to bail someone. And behind there, at the counter, it says it's written clearly in there. Bail is free. Bail is free. Now they now said to me, I need to pay X, Y, Z of money before I could. And I said, Look, what well, it says, the bail is free. And I said, I'm going to make a report. The, the lady said to me openly, I said, you could go ahead and report me to this person, because she was here before she was promoted, and she taught us how to do this. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't make any difference. So it doesn't matter what you do. The laws of religion are there, but the corruption has actually eaten deep into everybody's flesh in this country that they don't even care, they, and they work with impunity. Who are you going to report to? If you, if you commit a crime and I'm your boss, you're going to report to me. I mean, if you report to me, obviously I've done that before I got promoted to where I am. I can't do anything. So that goes across all this um, uh, uh, issue we're talking about. Corruption is endemic into every fabric of this society. People are also advocating stiffer penalties. If and when uh, these uh, criminal elements are, are, are caught, if and when we have you know, better interagency relationships, uh, but then there will naturally be the turn or the time for arrests and prosecutions of obviously but you know some have said for the issue of kidnappings not is life sentence uh, but people are complaining we don't get to see as many we don't get to see as many uh, prosecutions and you know convictions and are these punishments on record even you know strong a deterrent to uh, stem these crimes what are your thoughts you and I are here about um, six seven years ago when kidnapping actually got to the peak in this country and a couple of states, or a few states, actually made a law. They enact a law that says every kidnapper goes, after you've been caught, um, is not sentenced to life. I think it's, um, is, it, is it death? Is it, I think it's a some death. States, some, some states state amended their, death their laws. I remember when Oshomali was the governor of um, Edo. Edo State. I, I, he signed it into law that every kidnapper should be sentenced to death. And some other states did the same thing, some lack imprisonment. But the question is, since that law in the last 10 years, how many kidnappers have been arrested? We have the case of this guy, what's his name? Evans, the kidnapper. Up to today, who knows the fate of? He's still under trial. On the trial, for how many years? The late justice is what they say was? 
Justice denied. Just denied. Just, just denied. Well, uh, so, so we have a lot of people like every kidnap that they've been caught in this country. There's no prosecution that we, we, we can actually put some paper that it actually happened to them. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a money, it's a, it's a cash cow. And that's why it's actually growing every day. Perhaps some of these governors, are, they are skeptical about signing the you know, death what, what is it called? Death the sentence. death penalty. Death right. penalty. The death sentence, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So we, we do indeed, we get you know, to see you know, some hesitancy on the part of the, of the governors, even when the courts have done their bit. If you can, if you, can, if you make a law and you can't enforce the law, what's the point? I mean, kidnapping now has become a big business in this country. Billions rose over. They kidnapped for someone today. And some people are actually planning their own kidnapping so that they can make some money for themselves. So the point is, if the stiff penalty has not been enforced, it's not going to work. You can't make law as a government and not enforce that law. If we don't enforce the law, then it becomes irrelevant. So that is the reason why we're having all this criminality perpetrating and growing in this country. So we need to look into that. I mean, I don't know who has the political will to say, right, this is what the law says, and I'm going to follow it strictly. If we don't do that, we're not going anywhere in this country. We're just well, maybe ourselves. because people believe, or people believe that maybe their hands are also not clean, so they are not sure whether to sign the death you know, penalty or, or, or not. But then, talking about uh, bad roads, uh, let me just um, read out an excerpt which the national president of NATO, as Alaji Yusuf said, he said, theoretically, uh, free market, freight, uh, freight costs should be dictated by demand and supply dynamics with rates negotiated between marketers and transporters. But then achieving these has proven difficult, uh, despite our operational costs, particularly in Forex and diesel skyrocketing to unsustainable levels, et cetera. Let me just jump to, because he's saying that uh, with the issue of this bad road and all of the factors, it's supposed to, the price of PMS and diesel are supposed to be very, they're supposed to be expensive, you know, looking at the global, yeah. uh, uh, the, uh, global force. But then he's saying that the government is not listening to them. And the bad roads also is affecting their ability to supply you know, diesel to some of these places. Uh, what, um, what issue do you think this can generate, especially when it comes to having adequate supply of petrol across the nation? Well, 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 well it's a demand and supply issue in here. It's a market force. Now, the price of petrol has been determined. We own the price of petrol, but it, it, it differs in various area states and so on and so forth. But, the NATO um, chief should actually state out what are the um, issues that he actually wants the government to actually tackle. We need to know that first. If it's well, one, of it, one, of, one yeah. of it is the bad roads we're talking about mm -hmm. because it's saying that um, apart from the global you know, impact on the price of crude oil, the bad roads too are supposed to be factored into their pricing system. Mm -hmm. yeah. However, he's also um, you know, optimistic that um, you know, this year during the course of the year, uh, diesel will be cheaper, you know, at least for them to reduce their overhead costs in addition to the, le the challenges they face in applying their trade. Yeah, if we still import diesel, it can't be cheaper because we have to look at the landing cost. I mean, the higher the prices of the crude oil goes in the in, in international market, the higher it goes, the price comes in locally as well. Yeah. Talking, about, talking about the roads, let's roll back about 30, 40 years. When we have trucks, this happens in all the climb, especially in the developed countries. There's something they call Waybridge. I'm not sure if you heard about it. It's called Waybridge. Waybridge is a mechanism that has been built on the road, especially on the motorways, like the, our, own, our own expressway. Mm. So every vehicle that actually passes through that road goes through that Waybridge. So they weigh what you have on your vehicle. That's for the trucks. On the trucks. Right. And you pay a fee. Okay. There's some everywhere in the country. They just all just been abandoned. There's one now, very close to, to uh, us here. Uh, yeah, here there's some that's old day, there's some that's old day, that way. They've all been abandoned. The reason for those way bridge is to, to raise extra funding. You see, the government alone, especially our government here, don't have enough funds to actually build a superb highway for the country. But what they can do is build a road. You could get a loan to build a road, but it needs to be told. When you toll road, you raise money. If we don't have this mechanism in place as a government to raise extra funds for our roads, tolling of our roads, um, way bridge for trucks, to raise extra money. Even the toll well. gates, you know, you, we also used to have, you know, toll gates. So, yeah, that, that, that's what I'm saying, the toll, yeah. 
But, 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 but I think um, the, the regime, the administration of, of, of Olisha Gomba Sanjo actually dis, you know, dismounted all, all of this because they were not, you know, um, there accountability. That, yeah, there was, there was no accountability. Again, there's not corruption, the government corruption again. Mm -hmm. Even if you, go, if you go through all the roads in Lagos that's been told, I think the MM2 is mm -hmm. told the story as well. But the question is, where did those funds go to? Ask that question. I mean, from my understanding, what happened is they gave a contract to a private person. Mm -hmm. You pay that money, you make your money from there. So it's a private business. And the reason why the past president, the government just dismantled all those roads, because those monies were then going back to the government coffers to repair our roads. So what we need to do technically is to toll our roads, put way bridge in our roads for, for those trucks, then it should be concession. But would you still advocate, you know, them, these fees being brought back if, if well monitored? Of course, of course. It happens in every other But the crime. timing, amidst the socio-economic challenges, you know, the, the timing, do you think it will sit well with the people? Look, there is no other way around. For you to have something fixed, no pain, no gain. You have to go through some series of pain before you have the gains. I mean, if we complain about our roads, you can't leave the roads alone for the government to fix. If you want the government to fix the roads, you need to have to pay some fees to actually have some extra funds to fix the roads. That's what we need to do. So, and there's, there, there, there must be some stringent, some stringent measure in place that if you destroy any of the infrastructures on our road, you need to fix it. If you look at this burger, that bridge at, uh, that, that bridge at Kara Burger there, you have accident happens there all the time. And all the struggle, the bricks, I mean, the, the, the fencing on the bridge, the, the, the mess of the bridge, and they just live and go. Who monitors all those? The government has to come back and plunge in money into that. It's not, it's not tenable. If you, if you, there should be a student law in place that if you destroy or damage any of the don't public infrastructure, whoever does that should fix it. There should be right. a penalty in place to get it done. That's the only way we could actually have a good road right. uh, in place. Yeah. Michael Adele, they're speaking about a total overhaul, you know, correction across board, not just government, That's but right. even but even the government. Uh, thanks a lot, Mr. Adele, for Thank all you your for contributions yes. on the program Thank you. this morning. Quickly now, Afghan updates uh, is next. And ahead of the Super Eagles quarterfinal match against Angola on Friday, first choice goalkeeper Stanley Wabili is back in training. The media manager of the Super Eagles, Baba Femi, Raji early on Wednesday, speaking with uh, the TVC News Sports crew, says the medical crew haven't confirmed that uh, he will be, that Wabali will be available for the match. I wouldn't say uh, if he will be available for selection on, on Friday against Angola, but the good thing is uh, he's been doing, he's been working with, uh, with the physios walking as a walking during training and also the officials are working on him to ensure he's in good shape you know leave two touches with the ball and all those stuff but um we'll wait and see what happens well i believe there uh, friday is almost here ibrahim uh but uh, <laughs> We know how uh, very, you know, expectant Nigerians are against uh, this quarterfinals that we move past right. uh, th that stage. And um, this, this particular goalkeeper, Stanley Wabili, uh, is a, a critical member of the crew and we indeed hope and wish him a speedy recovery. That's right. You know, I, I said, yeah, that he's, he's going to be you back. You saw the match. Yeah, the, the, the last definitely. Match. You know, he, he's a impressive. Im impressive uh, everyone was like, ah, what's going to happen? Because the guy... The guy really, really knows, knows how to, you know, keep the, keep the ball away from the goalposts. You know, he's really impressed. very fantastic so far. And then our defense system too, you know, those guys, kudos to them. And, you know, I'm, look, I'm, I'm really looking forward to how it's going to be our next match. Uh, I hope that we are, we are able to bring the, the trophy home. And that's what I, that's the, the, the least I want to hear but, about this AFCON. Absolutely. You know, nothing but cherry news uh, all, right. all the way. Uh, and Nigerians are, are united. I, uh, naturally, we all know the uniting force that football brings, especially on uh, international platforms uh, as this. So apart, we're, apart from those we're who, who, we're apart from those who take them. their monies because they, oh. will, they will be divided. You're no, right. No, no, you're, you're right. That's a different, <laughs> that's a different, different passion. <laughs> that, that's a different passion.
mentioned that at a different world, uh, you know, altogether. But um, yes, uh, we will definitely uh, be rooting for them and wish them all the best moving beyond the quarterfinal stage and yes, bringing home the trophy. That's how we wrap up the program, TVC Breakfast, this Thursday. Uh, and we must tell you that all the views and reactions of all our resource persons are theirs that have no connection with TVC News. From all of us here, thanks a lot for watching and hope you can join us again uh, tomorrow for the Friday edition of TVC Breakfast. Up next is your view with the ladies. Bye now and have a great day.